Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we're very excited to have everyone on. I think uh, so far we have our 150 participants right now. So thank you for taking the time uh, to join us on this uh, historical location. So on behalf of the faculty, students, and staff of the Africana Studies Department at BMT University, um, I welcome you to our inaugural event celebrating 50 plus years of the African Studies Department at BMT University. Uh, we hope to hold an in-person celebration in fall 2021 uh, if the COVID pandemic is well controlled. And I also want to use this opportunity to say that our other invited panelists, specifically the women uh, that were part of this movement, were unavailable to participate at this time, but they definitely will be attending the in-person event in the fall. So just a quick thing to understand, because someone said to me, what is, the, what is the goal behind this? Well, you see, our goal going forward in the department is one, to celebrate our past history and achievements. As the saying goes, we stand tall because we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Two, our second goal is to affirm our presence through engaging scholarship on black and brown experiences. As it goes, to go far, you have to go together. And three, to prepare for the future by educating the next generation about our struggles, our triumphs, and our legacies. Because a man that does not know where he's coming from cannot have a clear sense of how he got to where he is or how to move forward. So it's really my great privilege and honor to welcome our panelists in celebrating our past while looking to the future. So our panel is made up of trailblazers who laid the foundation for the African Studies Department, and of course, future leaders who are already leading part for a bright future. So it is my honor to welcome first and foremost, Dr. John Riley, a former student of Den Upper College and now BMT University. Dr. Riley has multiple degrees, served as a faculty at BMT University, and has been taught many students and colleagues. I'll read a line from his credo, uh, that best describe him. He said, I believe in justice and freedom. To me, liberty is priestly and kingly. Freedom is my bright, liberty my angel of life, and justice is my God. So thank you so much, Dr. Riley, for joining us. I, I appreciate that, yeah. And, uh, if I, <coughs> uh, I'm going to introduce others. So, mm -hmm. so the next in our panel is Dr. William Lewis. Uh, William Lewis, also a former student of the Den Upper College and now BMT University. Uh, he also served as a faculty and administrator at BMT University. Dr. Lewis is the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of Spanish at Vanderbilt University, where he edits the Afro-Hispanic Review. He has also taught at Denmark College, Washington University in St. Louis, and Yale University. Dr. Lewis has authored, edited, and co-edited 14 books and more than 100 scholarly journals article. So currently, he's finishing a monographic study of the life and works of the Cuban enslaved poet, Juan Francisco Man Manzano. Uh, born and raised in New York City, uh, Dr. Lewis is highly and widely regarded as a leading authority on Latin America, Caribbean, Afro-Hispanic, and Latino U.S. literatures. Dr. William Lewis, welcome to the panel. Thank you. So next on our panel is Mr. Rodney Young. For the past 20 years, uh, Mr. Rodney Young, a Rochester native, saw, uh, served as the Senior Relationship Manager and Coordinator of the African American Leadership Development Program for the United Way of Greater Rochester Incorporated. Mr. Young is also a former student at BMT University and has received many awards in recognition of its activism, community advancement, and documentation, including the Rochester Association of Black Journalists Award for his years of service and dedication to making a photographic record of the life and events in the Rochester African American community. So Mr. Rodney Young, welcome to the panel. So next on the panel is Mr. Larry Gottian who was also a former student at BMT University and also a faculty at BMT University. He actually started the cinema department at BMT University, where he also served as chair and taught until 1998. He has made many films, 
that are both formal, experimental, and have been shown at museums and film venues and festivals throughout the world. So it's really a pleasure to also have you on board, Mr. Gottingham. Welcome to the panel. It's my pleasure. Now, in looking forward, we also have two student members who are serving as respondents on this panel. As I mentioned earlier, they are already setting the stage as future leaders. From the African Student Organization, we have Ayet Perugi Perugino Briuma. She is the senior, she is a senior majoring in biology and serves as one of the senior advisors for the African Student Organization, as well as the treasurer for the Juvenile Urban Multicultural Program. Hired hopes to one day become a surgeon and establish our own nonprofit organization for the goal of providing access to medical treatment. Ayet, welcome to the panel. Thank you. And final, but, least, but last but not the least, from the Black Student Union, we welcome Kendra Gorgug. I think I mispronounced your name, I apologize profusely. Kendra is a junior majoring in English with a minor in African Studies program. She's an advocate for black, black artistry and a writer. She created the Black Museum, BMT University's first art museum, solely portraying the work of black and brown folks. Kendra is the vice president of the Black Student Union, as well as the former publications coordinator for the organization. She served as the student association director of constituency relations at BMT University uh, or, uh, Orientation Advisor, and she's one of the two black women on the Men of Color Advisory Board and a member of the BMT University Emerging Scholars Program. So Kendra, welcome to the team. Thank you. So on that note, I really want to say thank you to all our panelists for being here. I'm going to start off with the general uh, questions that I want our panelists to take the time to answer. And so, First question, of course, is how did you end up at BMT University as a student? Where and how did you all meet? How did the Afro-Latino Alliance begin? What role did faculty play in your development? And what was the social climate in the, 19, the late 1960s right here at BMT? And what actions led to the formation of the department? So I'm opening it up to the panelists. Okay, fine. Uh, how I got to Zuni it was really Harper College then. There was a professor uh, of mine at um, Dutchess Community College where I started going to college who opened the door for me to come to Harper College, which was his alma mater. Uh, he made special uh, efforts to um, make sure that the admission process would be fair to my application. And uh, he made sure that I would be um, treated like other people, other students would be treated with regard to financial aid and things along that line. So his name was Hotchkiss and he was a uh, minister okay, uh, in addition to being a professor. And he sort of took it under, uh, <clears throat> took me under his wing for a brief portion, for a portion of time, just to make sure that I would go through. So when I was uh, there at uh, Harper College, Okay, it was, uh, I was one of just very few uh, African-American students or even people, persons of color, students of color on campus. There were only about a handful of us on campus that I could recall anyway at that time. And there wasn't a lot of interaction between us at all. So uh, the, David was one and he and I used to go to a dinner, a lunch and dinner every now and then and talk about things. He was rather um, provincial, conservative. I think in his outlook, um, almost predictably, predictable in what he would say or do because he was so conventional in his outlook. Then the other one was John Myers, who was a graduate student. Um, I think he was from Mississippi. Okay, and we were so we used to converse about the different things that we were experiencing on campus. I think there were about three women of African American descent or um, heritage there. But uh, only one of them, I think, had, had a minor interaction with, um, uh, her name is on the, almost on the tip of my tongue, but I can't quite recall it at all. But it was a, a space where it was kind of bleak for us. All of the, David left fairly shortly um, after um, my encounter with him when I first went there. And uh, uh, so it was rather bleak, kind of lonely uh, in terms of, um, having people that I could converse with about the full range of my experiences and being, you know, make those connections with, we could just shoot the breeze about any old thing. 
uh, the majority of the people were white. There, were, there was a heavy representation of Jews from New York City, New York City area. Uh, but uh, there was also a heavy representation of people that we would call, uh, you know, white Christian. Uh, and some of them were, <laughs> were borderline white trash. Okay, there was one guy named Ranch, for instance, who just practiced all of the bovine behaviors of what you would call white trash. And uh, he was lovable in one, one respect, you know, and, but in the other respect that he was really grounded in that, that uh, kind of odd culture. Eisenberg talks about that in her book called White Trash. He was kind of like locked into that thing. And others, there, were, there was a range of things going on. So anyway, uh, the first year I took some, was involved in sociology, didn't like it. It didn't like me. So I nearly dropped out of the college and then I came back around uh, to it. And then uh, I changed my major to literature, to, uh, to English and literature. Uh, Rodney Young, I met Rodney Young, I think he came on board uh, at least a semester, if not a year after I'd been there. And uh, we became acquainted. And then later on, when the, uh, the, social, the special missions program opened up, then we had a, more students who came on board and I met Willie, Willie uh, Luis, and we formed a relationship. And then we set, we, we established the Afro-Latin Alliance out of our relationship and with that, with ourselves and also with other students of uh, Latino uh, heritage and also African-American heritage. And that led to, after the Afro-Latin Alliance, that led to uh, the splinter groups, the two different groups of BSU and then the uh, Latino Heritage Group. And then we moved, then we, that led to the development of the departments. Um, I was, I left the university uh, and graduated and then uh, students, Rodney, Dot uh, Marshall and others recruited me to come back. Marty Simmons, I had to be interviewed by Marty Weaves in his hospital bed. He was so sickly. Uh, to get the job as the first counselor, first African American counselor in the, in the, in the uh, special missions department. Okay. And uh, again, my, my sensibilities and the sense of myself would really went up against that of John Benson, who was the white uh, head of that department. He had, he had taken advantage of an opportunity to ensconce himself in administration through the money that was available for the special missions program. So he became a friend to Blacks and Latinos and, and hired some really excellent people, Fred Ted McKee, who's a federal judge now, okay, and the others, David, came in, uh, and then and I forgot her name, but I'll remember later, she was from Chicago. Uh, really excellent people, and Ted did a great job on recruiting uh, great students uh, to the to their program and the middle students went on and became super successful, disproportionate even to what white students, if you really match up our small numbers against the majority, the, the great numbers of whites, you look at their accomplishment compared to the stellar conference of the students who came in under Ted McKee's recruitment, you say they were, it's a, well, they just knocked the ball out of the park. They were just fantastic with publications and great, great, just great careers. And of course, we had our bad apples too, but, but I'm talking about proportionally. So I went on, you know, when I graduated, I also went around to different colleges trying to set up consortiums of black student unions so that there would be some strength in being able to um, deal with questions about our presence on campus and also to open up programs. I went to Vassar College and talked to the, the women there and their, uh, their organizations. I went to New Falls and Cortland and places like that and, and got some interesting responses. So I stayed active for a while. Okay, and then when I came on campus, we got more active and then left from there, went on to civil rights. So if you're looking at how this, this genesis and what, it, what it's all about, you know, it's just step-by-step -step process of just kind of following your intuition, your instincts about what needs to be done that is just and right. And the reason why I say that just and right, it, it, it's all about the eternal, what, what, what some people call the eternal verities. It's about core values, the core value of being a human being. If you want to know how I got involved in all this activism and how I evolved as an activist, I was born an activist when I said yes to life. Saying yes to life means you have to be an activist. You have to be proactive. Not saying yes to life means that you're reactive. You're just the opposite of that. And life is about always evolving. 
Life is about ever growing. Life is about expanding your consciousness. It's about opening your heart, opening your hands. It's about opening your spirit. It's about always moving to those places that other people would not would fear to go for positive purposes of positive transformations of everything around you. We are life's gardeners. We are to create beautiful flowers out of the dung heap of humanity and everything else. So that was embedded in my spirit. So whatever I did, no matter how crazy it seemed, I would always come back to those core principles. So when I got involved in act activism, that was my mission, okay? It was to make the ugly beautiful. It was to make the insane sane. It was to make the hate love. It was to convert those negative things into positive things, no matter where I found them. And I, again, I'm not some kind of saint, I'm not kind of prophet. I was just an average little guy from an upscale, uh, up, up, from a, from a, a um, upstate town okay, in, um, in New York, coming out of work a day, um, parents who weren't even bourgeois, okay, who had gone, who had, who had uh, achieved enough for themselves that they moved from rags to riches. My parents died millionaires. They did not die paupers. Okay, so they went from zero, from being deeply in debt to having somebody, they fulfilled their American dream. Okay, but they had an emphasis on character and on the eternal verities. What I saw missing at Harper College and in most of the white world is character, the lack of character, a reliance on lies, mendacity, a reliance on bigotry, a reliance on exclusion, and reliance on all kinds of things that mangle the human heart, the human mind, the human spirit, the human body for no good purpose other than to profit some assholes materially. And that's what I still see going on now and our politics has one of the worst of those people as president and one of the worst of those parties in the Republicans sort of undergirding him and supporting him to the point that we have to now vote whether we're gonna have a, a humane, a democracy at all, much less a humane democracy on November the 3rd. So the mission has always been to work against that ugliness of humanity that was generated by the founding fathers Okay, and how they left out women from the constitutions and how they ignored us in the constitution and how they generated this whole notion that white identity is American identity. Thank so that you was so much. Sure. Thank you so sure. much, so much. Sure. Doctor. I okay, mean, sure. I, I know we're going to have a lot I'm of so, conversation so about this. No, 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 don't worry. <laughs> I know we're going to have a lot of conversation about this. I want uh, uh, Dr. William Lewis. Yes, thank uh, you. Yes. Please, can you ask the same question, please? Yes, I, um, I think it's befitting for me to speak after John Riley because uh, when I first went to Binghamton, uh, I, was, um, I was housed in Whitney Hall and so was he, and he was a, an outgoing senior and I, uh, and I was an incoming freshman and he uh, took me under his wing and, uh, and helped me with the transition process. So originally I'm from uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan and I went to Seward Park High School. And at Seward Park, I was uh, junior class president and, uh, and then president of the general organization. And it must have been uh, sometime during the senior year, um, a gentleman, uh, John mentioned him uh, by the name of John Benson, who was recruiting for Harper College came to our high school. And I remember uh, sitting in the uh, auditorium uh, during, um, uh, during um, a, uh, a, a off period. And he began to talk to me about, um, about Harper College and about how it would be good for me to, uh, uh, to go to Harper College. And in fact, he even talked about, well, you know, I could even show up during the summer to take some uh, courses in math and so on and so forth. And I had never heard about Harper College, and uh, I'm, and as I found out later on about the um, the reputation Harper College had, I didn't really um, fathom uh, why he would want me to go to Harper College, because uh, my main interest in high school was in leadership and being involved in the general organization, working with students, so on and so forth. But uh, my grades weren't the best. Um, 
And so uh, when I did go to Harper College and he also recruited uh, two other students from my high school, uh, Israel Colon and, and um, I forget the, uh, the uh, Angel Morales. Uh, we all three went together uh, to Harper College and uh, once we got there, uh, we saw that um, we were wondering if we belonged uh, because it wasn't the environment that we had expected to find. It was totally different. Uh, in fact, um, um, I, I continue to say that uh, for me, the image that comes to mind is a black dot, a small dot on a white sheet of paper. And that's what we were exposed to. Uh, meeting uh, John Riley and then another upperclassman, uh, Woody Bandable, uh, who also um, took me under his wing. Uh, John, more so in terms of academics, uh, John helped me with my papers. I don't, uh, I, I'm proud to admit, uh, and I learned a great deal from him. And Woody was more involved in the social activities, so he was help. He also helped me in in that respect. And I think that uh, we through our conversations, the three of us and with other students uh, trying to find a sense of identity. How do we fit in and how do we make Harper College a place that we can uh, thrive in? And at that same time, it meant us educating Harper College of who we were. So after uh, numerous conversations, uh, we decided to, um, to uh, create this organization called the Afro-Latin Alliance. And it was a, I think uh, it, it was, we were visionary without really knowing uh, what we were doing. We knew that it was a matter of survival for us uh, to be able to find some kind of an identity. We didn't want to assimilate and we were proud of who we were, but we didn't really know how to express that. And so um, what happened is that uh, we, we did create uh, this organization uh, called Afro-Latin Alliance. And if you look at the, um, uh, the acronym uh, is ALA. ALA in Spanish means uh, wing. And I think at that time we looked upon the, uh, the um, uh, African uh, American students and the Latinx students coming together as being two wings of the same of the same bird. So the, the, the ala in Spanish meaning wing was be, became very important for us. And we decided not to go with a traditional uh, organization of having president and vice president and treasurer, but we decided to have an equal sharing of, uh, of decision-making uh, for the three of us. And so John, uh, Woody and I became the leaders of the, uh, of the organization. And from there, it was just a matter of, um, creating activities that made us feel uh, the kind of people we wanted to be and the kind of experience that we had. Growing up in the Lower East Side, uh, there was always an interaction of different uh, racial groups. So it was very uh, comforting to see that there were other students of color and we all gravitated to each other, uh, to looking for a common identity. And as we created the um, Afro-Latin Alliance, then it was a matter of bringing uh, social events, uh, bringing political events, but also uh, demanding from the uh, administration courses and professors, uh, professors who looked like us, and courses that, re that also uh, had to do with our own particular experience so that it wasn't just um, uh, a, 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 a university that was uh, geared towards uh, Eurocentric uh, ideas and values, but that there was another world that wasn't being really represented. And that's the one that we belong to. And we wanted to do was to educate the university, but also to be able to have courses and have people and counselors who looked like us. So that's kind of a, a brief uh, understanding of, uh, of, of, um, of the creation of, of the Afro-Latin Alliance and, and my contribution to it. Wow, thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Rodney Young. Uh, we have questions from the audience, uh, from the attendees, so I will ask those later on, but I'll open it up, Mr. Mr. Young, the same questions to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank the university and the uh, Africana Studies Department for putting together this, this event uh, and uh, inviting me to participate. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the uh, organizers for all the courtesies that you've extended to us uh, during this process. Uh, I was born in Rochester, New York. 
And I would say that I was born to a matrilineal family when it came to educational expectations and attainment. For example, I'm holding up a picture of my grandmother who graduated from Hampton Institute in 1906. Wow. Uh, her name, it was Lucy Hughes Allen. And she married a farmer uh, who could not write his own name. But she maintained that standard of education when she passed it on to my mother, her daughter. My mother, Dr. Alice Holloway Young, got her bachelor's degree from Bennett College and went on to get her master's and doctorate from the University of Rochester and became the uh, founding trustee of Monroe Community College in Rochester and also chaired that board for 20 years. So there was no expectation that I would not go to college. That was the expectation. Uh, when I got to Binghamton, which was, as you know, a highly rated uh, college, Harper College was known as the Swarthmore on the Susquehanna, and it was a prestigious place to be. I was shocked to find out that out of 550 freshmen for, that came in that year, because they were expanding the college at the time, there were only six black students. Wow. And four of those students were said to be part of a newly formed special admissions program. So in the state of New York, that had at that time 17.8 million people, 25% of them who, of whom were African American, they could only find six African American students to come to Binghamton. I was shocked and appalled. I also looked around and found only one African American faculty member at Binghamton. Again, shocked and appalled and motivated. I had no idea that I would get involved as an activist coming to Harper, but I was compelled to figure out ways to get involved. The first day I was on campus, I was walking around and students who are on campus now can imagine that big hill that the college is on. I was at the bottom of the hill and I was delighted to run into an African-American woman who also was a first year student. She quizzed me and she said to me, you know, I'm smarter than you are and I'm stronger than you are and I can prove it. I won't mention who the student, who the student was. And she's bent over and said, get on my back. Well, hey, someone's gonna show you how strong they are. I got on her back and she ran up that hill and deposit me at the top of the hill. Well, I knew from that very point that I was gonna to have to be part of a recruitment effort to bring more students to Binghamton if I wanted any kind of social life. So one of the things that happened when I met uh, Dr. Louise and Dr. Riley was yes, I was willing to join the African the Afro-Latin Alliance to advance several things, increase the student population, increase the faculty, and to also, once we got in the classroom, we saw that we, the demographic that was coming onto campus was not represented in the curricula. So we worked hard to figure out ways to advance the curricula. We did not know that it would take several years to complete what we were trying to do. Because on universities, as you know, if you're not in the budget, you don't exist. And it takes a while to work your way into the budget and to the policy positions that were necessary before we could, uh, we could do what we wanted to do with that regard. The 
courses that were offered were excellent, except they did not reflect us. So we knew that we had to take bold and sustained action in this strange and exciting environment, which it was, that was filled with such possibilities. Among the faculty, we found, we found what would be called today white allies. And one of those white allies was Professor Larry Gottheim. Now we had heard about uh, Professor Gottheim through, I had heard about him through John Riley, because Riley had uh, taken a course uh, on Marcel Proust, and he would come back excited talking about how great this course was and how great this professor was, talking about this, this French writer. And then when we found out that this French writer had acquired a 16 millimeter camera, somewhere along the line, we approached him to help us make a film about students coming from New York City, primarily, up to the campus. And he was enthusiastic because we didn't know at that time what he had a hidden genius for filmmaking. And as you heard earlier, he went on to establish the, the cinema department and also did some groundbreaking work of his own with experimental film and also did some groundbreaking work in collaboration with folks from New York City uh, over the years and generated a, a whole generation of, of filmmakers from that department. But he started with a little film, which we're gonna see later. And uh, the soundtrack originally was conversations that the students had. And I recorded on my little reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape recorder. And when we sent the film down to Movie Labs in New York, Movie Lab in New York City, it didn't, it, it didn't take the soundtrack as well as we had hoped. So there's some audio challenges, but I think you will love the visual and I, I'll let, if it's okay, I'll pass it on to Dr. Gottheim yes. uh, to talk a little bit about his experience in the film. Thank you. Thanks. Um, by the way, I wasn't a student at Binghamton Oh, uh, thank you. I had gotten a PhD in comparative literature at Yale, and I was in the English department. Now, somehow, I, I don't remember, but I was impatient and looking for something else to do with my life, and I had gotten a 60 millimeter camera and was feeling my way uh, towards uh, becoming a filmmaker, which I did eventually become. Uh, somehow, uh, the it now seems to me kind of marvelous that I was just so close to the group before the film even started. But that's how it was. It seemed very natural. And the idea for the film was something that they thought of and I immediately thought it was a great idea. Um, there was no direct, I mean, nobody is directed to what they say. Everything that um, happens and what they do is something that just happened spontaneously uh, within the group. Um, uh, and then uh, after this period of filming, uh, Rod Young and Sharon Sizemore stayed on, I think, during the summer. And so that they were at my side, so that it was always that there was a kind of um, represented in a way I was, of course, making a film, my own film, but it was a film that was uh, uh, allowing the voices and the images of these people to uh, manifest uh, itself. Um, and now, thinking about it, I have a lot of things to think about, and I won't go on and on, but um, I, I was thinking this morning of this thing of these um, schools for American Indians that were established uh, in the 19th century. And the idea was to take these uh, students and make them forget about their language and their culture and make them assimilated into uh, white American society. Now, these students that were finding themselves at Binghamton were in a kind of special way. I mean, in some way, they were learning whatever 
subjects they were studying amazingly when I think of John Riley was in a Proust seminar that, that I taught, but they never forgot and in fact were um, absorbed. They would want to learn more uh, and express more about their heritage. Uh, I think that's kind of amazing. So um, I think the film speaks for itself. So let's just watch it. Dr. Matthews? The sound isn't on. Look at me as just another student. They look at me as a Puerto Rican, you know. 
somebody who was supposed to be different. It's really difficult for the one that needs to find exactly what it is. We've been living with them so many years. That's true. We know them in and out of the garage for years and years. You know, when you're going to want a white baby, it's followed by Negroes. Now, because the whites, the mothers didn't even want them to be born in their own life. Makers, 
and in its greatest. See, the people who are made to feel most sensitive are going to be the most human. This is us. We become the more human the ones that they use for psychological experiments because they've been too far abstracted you know, to see the wrong not up there. The rest of us, you know, the human. So therefore, you know, I think what we're doing in our club really is to not only make ourselves feel secure and popular, but try to make other people see, you know, what's going on with themselves. They feel this abstraction is making them is isolating them. One of science leaders conscious of the sign of men but lean on their killing daily. You know, every sign of men is the negative kind of weapon. You know, we make these we get first to the moon and where the hell are we in the metrics? It's ridiculous. It's the whole stupidity. Now we're with liberalized education itself, a lot of people say you're gonna for good of it. These idiots on the outside have been killed, you know, and for their whole lifetime, like by people who weren't conscious of themselves, you know. We're told that you have to make a buck to live. That's the only way you can live. You know? And they, they've been lamenting this fact, you know, being killed by it. They also ask you, what could a liberal arts you know? Liberal arts, I think, is good because it's still conscious. It should. If it becomes too analytical, then it's going to remove the state of conscience. So conscious is a basic humanist, you know, to make us all as human communities feel a part of each other, which we should basically share. I'm not talking about a religious well, conscience. The realist comes back and actually says you can't eat it. Well, we can eat it. That's the point. As it is, you feel enough on every human being, you know, you have enough food to eat. <laughs> you can't eat it, you know. But if you get too much of it, it's just shallow. It's nothing. This is what really the basic white man's been offering. They they build this research and they need tall guys and type of thing. You know, it's physical. It's nothing. They make every kind of thing that they like. You know, it's it's unrealistic. They try to engage yourself. You know, to build you into a thing, not a human being. You know, I think our our club is actually an assertion of humanness rather than an assertion of you know, color. So we haven't defined what color is. Just a human feelings. We want to maintain these feelings. We want our own way of doing things, individuality. We're actually helping society, not coming. Okay. Mm -hmm. This school system is separate. One by one. There's an awful struggle to try to maintain your own identity value. We have to match it. Thank you so very much. Um, uh, so at this point, we're going to have um, Hyatt. Uh, we have questions from the audience, which we will pose, but we wanted to get a response from the two uh, student panelists, uh, Hyatt. And um, see, I'm blanking out on names and I apologize. Hyatt and Kendra. So we're going to open it up. Um, Dr. Matthews. Could you unmute them? So want to get your reaction. I know the audio was uh, was not was a bit difficult, uh, but the students were the one talking in the background, so you could actually, if you listen, you could hear them uh, talk. So I wanted to get um, the reactions of Hyatt and Kendra in light of these issues. And you guys are also welcome to ask our panelists questions. I would definitely be asking questions from the audience from time to time. Thank you, Dr. Okoro. So I definitely thought it was quite amazing to see the work that precedented, the work that I and other folks that I'm surrounded by on campus continue to strive towards. Um, I think even the fact that the film juxtaposed, you know, the lives that you had in the city versus how it was being at the university and even seeing all that went into the creation of the Alliance. Um, it was amazing. For the panelists, I do wonder, I noticed that in talking about the creation of the Alliance, um, you speak of straying from Eurocentricity, but the fact that only men started the Alliance is rooted in those same Eurocentric ideals, you know, um, patriarchy and these things. So I was wondering how you've worked towards centering women of color, particularly Black women, in the Alliance, in the work that you continued, and what struggles did you view of the women of color, the Black women on campus, and through the work that you did? And how have you 
like I said, worked on centering that. I was positive that no six, uh, black organization could be successful without women committing themselves to those organizations. And that would also include fraternities. I even posited that when I was a student, just by observing the evolution of black culture. And when I also looked at the demographics with regard to voting, I see that the only, the only voting demographic in America that upholds any values that are worthwhile along the lines of humanity and democracy are black women. So black women are the bastion, whether they receive the recognition or not, and whether they assert themselves to receive that recognition or not. Our, uh, it was only a natural process to open up our little <clears throat> triumvirate of Willie, myself, and Rodney, and then Woody. It was, it was, a, it was a, <clears throat> a four of us, not three. But to anyone else who wanted to participate, and we found that, of course, the women are, are indispensable, okay, and also they become whatever the contributions they wanted to make or what we wanted to make. There was never an issue with us about sexism or misogyny or any of that kind of stuff. I don't think I know I didn't feel it, and I didn't hear any commentary from anybody else about that. So leadership was leadership and participation was participation. I remember that um, the first when I first met Dot Marshall, she was a bit standoffish. Okay, uh, my first encounter with her when she was a freshman there, but then without within a semester or so, she warmed up really well and became a major participant and player and, and a wise counsel to everything that we did. So it wasn't that we were males were trying to control anything. It's just that we initiated it. Okay? And if somebody had to initiate it, we just happened to be the ones to do so. Um, if you want to fault uh, something for gender disparity, you might fault the uh, special missions program for not maybe recruiting enough women. Uh, if you look at, again, demographics with regard to academics, women usually excel over men anyway. Uh, I know that schools where I had the chance to review admissions usually shaved off points for the men, <clears throat> made it easier for the men to get in and harder for the women. Women were more qualified than the men. So I mean, it, we're, we're dealing in a patriarchal, patrilineal society. By definition, it favors men over women. It's not going to stop. If you look at the lives of women, most women have the last names of men. If you want to say that you own something, you stick your name on it. You stick your name on the women that, that you bring into marriage, you stick your name on the children. <clears throat> that's a custom that's been going on for thousands of years, not only just in our culture, but others. I think until people wake up okay, to that patriarchy and the uh, inequities in it and the patrilineal inequities in the patrilineal systems, there are always going to be those inequities. But in terms of substantial participation, women were indispensable to the development of anything that we had to do or anything we had to say. They were, the, they were not just there as a backbone, but they were not only equal partners, but they were dominant in terms of sensibility and sagacity to be able to move us forward. And I think that Rodney and Willie and the rest of us didn't have, I don't remember us ever having any issues of machismos or uh, misogyny or anything like that uh, coming up. You know, even though like boys will be boys and girls will be girls, you got some differences that could come into play in terms of meeting the requirements, what we had to do to develop an agenda for activism and to meet that agenda the women and men were equal in the, in the, uh, in the activities, as far as I remember. Uh, John, let me make a couple of comments. Yeah. I'll reveal the name. Uh, Debbie Hoffman got me straightened out when she carried me up that hill. I remember, I remember <laughs> Debbie. I remember that moment too. <laughs> was that going to be, there was not going to be any foolishness. And if you look at the, um, mm -hmm. the makeup of that group shot, there's probably 13 people in that group chat. I, I would say uh, half of them are women or more are women. You know, when we, uh, we, we tried to communicate in many different ways. And at one point we had a, a newsletter, which was an internal newsletter to communicate among ourselves called Black Lash. And it was sort of playing the words of backlash, but this was Black Lash. And it uh, was put out by 
something called Wasi Opuma. We just took the first two letters of various people's last names. Washington, she was a woman. Simmons was a man. Young, me. Pujols, woman. And Marshall, Wasi Opuma. So, and we were putting out this newsletter just to communicate with the Latino and African American communities uh, so that we would know what's going on. Keep in mind, this is 50 years ago, a long time before any of this type of stuff existed. A long before title time, title the rest of it. <laughs> for, for, uh, for a while, I had a, a, a radio, campus radio show called uh, Black Essay. And we had topics like uh, Black authors from 1850, well, yeah, 1850 to uh, 1930, uh, the black presidential candidates at that time, uh, 1968, it was um, uh, Dick Gregory and Eldridge Cleaver. Or we had a, a program on black women looking at what two psychiatrists, Greer and Cobbs, were saying in their book at the time, Black Rage. And I remember that uh, Ada Pujols uh, was the, was the co-host for that and, and uh, did a beautiful job of uh, co-hosting with me on that radio program. Now, the next semester after we had done it, the campus radio wanted to change it from the Black Essay to New Perspectives on American History. So they were trying to walk us away from certain things. Uh, that were, they weren't used to at that point. But you persist, we communicated, we worked together. Um, it, some of our best uh, support, and we hope that we were supportive to them, were the women who are, were really sort of soldiers in arms. Um, uh, so I think you just have to work together, be cooperative, and realize, uh, like John said, after all, they are smarter than we are. Uh, Dr. We, uh, Luis, any response? Nick. Okay, all right, I'm unmuted now. Yes, um, the organization, the way I remember it, um, was egalitarian in the sense that we all participated and we all made decisions together. Uh, it just so happened that um, I guess for whatever reasons, some of us had a little bit more experience in terms of organization, but uh, everyone contributed and everyone um, had a say in the organization and there wasn't any real um, um, difference. Uh, we all had a mission. We all had a mission and the mission could only be accomplished if we all came together. I mean, all meaning, um, African-American students, uh, Latinx students, men, women, uh, anybody else who was there, uh, we needed everybody's energy uh, to uh, affect the kind of change that, that we at least initiated uh, and like to believe that, uh, that we were successful in that. But, um, but also if you look at the film, the way uh, Larry, um, uh, um, structured it. You have uh, Har you have uh, Harper College takes place in Harper College. Then we transfer to Harlem, and then to the Lower East Side. And so, looking at the various aspects, and in Harlem, it focuses on Jane and Louise Canty and her family. And so, there is a, a a segment that that has to do with with her family, uh, and then uh, and then my family in in the Lower East Side. But as, uh, as Rodney said, if you look at the composition of all the people who, in, who are in that gr group, the women uh, probably outnumber the men. I have a quick question along that line, just before um, uh, the next person asks a question. I wonder what pushback did you guys receive in your efforts to, to, in terms of forming this organization, in terms of laying the foundation for the department the way we have it? What, what kind of pushback? Because, you know, the oppressor will never tell the oppressed the way out of oppression because the existence of the oppressor depends on the existence of the oppressed. So what kind of pushback, if any, did you guys receive in your effort to, to lay this foundation, to have a department on this? I think, yeah, let, go, go ahead. Go, no, ahead, no, Rodney. go ahead, Rodney. 
you know, one of the things uh, that was part of the magic of the uh, Afro-Latin Alliance is that we had a structure and I was looking and I, I noticed that we, we we had a pretty elaborate constitution. <laughs> we It's five pages long. So we had a way to proceed. And as we sort of evolved to include the Black Student Union and the Latinx uh, focused organization, we still connected effectively looking at our goals of increasing the population and enhancing the curriculum. And everything evolved. And one of the things that happened is the university put up a put up together a committee of concerned students that also included faculty people and it was chaired by uh, Faye Washington one of the strong members of uh, our organizations and we also had what we called an ad hoc committee that fed black ad, uh, ad hoc it was an ad hoc committee that fed ideas into this concerned student organization that was really in charge of uh, mechanizing our, our dreams and desires into reality. So we were in, it was a student faculty committee that had the ability to sit down and work through problems and concerns. And one of the concerns was a fiscal one we didn't have money to do, it wasn't in the budget to do what we're asking to do, to do. Hire a recruiter, hire people for the special admissions department. So what we did, we, we actually went to Albany with faculty. See this, you have to be willing to collaborate and you have to feel that uh, people are not against you necessarily, but, but you can cooperate. And we went to Albany and talked to, uh, this Dr. Smoot, who was in charge of funding for these special initiatives all across the state. And we convinced them to give us resources that we could use to put in the budget line to do the hiring. And then we worked to, uh, to recruit. Now we knew John, so we reached out to John. We knew Ted McKee, uh, like John said, went on to be a federal court judge, he married one of the Binghamton graduates, Anna McKee, who is an MD, a hospital administrator, and is now on that committee, nationwide committee that sets standards for all medical procedures and operations. So brilliance was there. It was just a matter of not being impatient. And you did hear some impatience in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, Marty Simmons wanted to do some other things. We could have been like Cornell, if we had gone in that direction, where there was violence, potential violence. Instead, we were methodical and we were looking for allies. We're building relationships. We were working forward. Now this took time, this took energy. I know I was all in and it, it worked against me in many ways because you balancing the academics and the activism is a big challenge and that's something that you better look out for. But we were able to, by being persistent and consistent, move forward. It took a couple of years to get the results we were looking for, but we knew what we wanted. We learned the process, we worked collaboratively and we were able to achieve some results. Same thing with the Africana Studies Department. We knew what we needed. We knew what we wanted. We went outside and got consultants. In this case, Jim Turner, who was at uh, uh, Ithaca College. He later became the, uh, the chair of the African Studies Department at Cornell. And he came in, came in and advised us. He said, don't just cobble together something, uh, people from different disciplines. He said, work to establish a department, a full department, hire your own faculty, work out your own curricula. That was great advice because the tendency is grab somebody from sociology, grab somebody from history, grab somebody from this 
different areas and put them together. So we learned, we took the time to do the research. When the college became more understanding that this could be a very positive, that we could have the first standalone Africana Studies Department in the whole SUNY system, then they got serious. And they sent a delegation, including myself, to the ASA, African Studies Association Conference in Montreal. Little did we know that that year, October 1969, the Black Caucus of that conference was presenting a paper with their ideas, which was rebuffed. And they took over a plenary session and basically disrupted the conference because they felt that ASA was uh, far too white in its makeup, far too Eurocentric in its findings in the research that they were funding. And John Hendrick Clark, an African-American professor, uh, moved and successfully initiated a new organization called the African Heritage Studies Association and tomorrow, they'll have their 51st conference of, of that particular gathering. But we were there methodically listening, researching, advancing, working collaboratively with faculty, not being impatient. What it took people like Dr. Luis, Dr. Wiley, Riley, assuring us that this was the way to go and uh, that's the way we achieved success. And along the way, we stimulated people like Dr. Gottheim to move forward with setting up a whole film department that he successfully ran for many years. So when you do it right, it has residual effects, yeah. positive effects mm -hmm. beyond what you can, wow. you can imagine. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, I know, Hayek, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, so um, in regards to the film, I found it like really amazing to see like the university during that time and like be able to recognize um, certain places as well as like the events that were occurring during that time and can also see like be depicted in our time now. Um, so one of the questions that I had was that um, for the um, Afro-Latin, Latinx alliance, you really see that um, it seemed to be like a place for you all where you all had each other and were able to like rely on each other. And my question basically is what would you say um, sharing that bond with each other and coming from like similar backgrounds, um, what would you say was the importance of that during that time? So to recapture what she said, what would you the panelists say was important in having that shared bond for that time period. Absolutely essential to have that bond. Um, people have to kind of embrace the fullness of the humanity of each other uh, in order to be able to commit to activism such as we were um, conceiving of and then initiating and then uh, assigning ourselves to. So to do that, you have to kind of feel each other out at the deeper levels of your natures, your personality, your singular personalities. And then also you have to kind of feel each other out in terms of the um, ideas that are forming out of your passions about what you want to do, where you want to go, you know, as a group. I think that takes a lot of massaging of personalities uh, and a lot of bonding uh, to get that massaging done and then also to set those agendas and then to commit to uh, implementing those agendas. So it's absolutely essential. You have to have people who are compatible with your natures and your dreams. Uh, if you have people who are too obstreperous, too outside of your natures and your dreams is best to, to let them go the walk their own paths and maybe they'll come back around when they see the wonderful things that you're doing and how it could benefit them or whatever 
but you need that compatibility from the outset. You shouldn't assume by appearance alone, people share your values and your objectives. We were lucky because um, our situation not only generated a lot of uh, tolerance for each other and then appreciation for each other, and then also the, the passions and then the dreams that came out of the passions and then the commitments to them, okay, all that kind of stuff. But it gave us a sense that we were sharing something uh, externally, in general, at the university. We were among the, we were a few among many of others. So that gave us a, a sense of community and even though there were, <laughs> we had our moments, I remember there was a Volkswagen moment, I think where a couple of guys jumped on the top of my Volkswagen and I kind of ran them in such a way that they ended up in the hospital and getting some, <laughs> you know, getting some treatment. Uh, we've had our moments of tension with each other. Okay? And uh, there were a couple of people did some things that were really horrible too. But in general, okay, in general, you know, we had enough people who understood we, we had a common situation we have shared values out of that common situation. We had shared goals, shared goals, and we and we had shared commitments to realize those particular aspirations. Okay, so that I would say, yeah, you, bonding is absolutely important. Um, you have to separate the chafe from the wheat. The people who are really committed, yeah, but again, your emphasis has got to be on those things that are most challenged and threatened. Okay, in your own humanity, in in your own. Um, tribal identity okay, uh, in the, all the values that you have. It's not just a fact of black or white. You have to explain to yourself what is this white thing that you're moving against to find space for yourself? What is this black thing that you're trying to perpetuate, that you're trying to assert in that space? And it, it, both things, you have to see the positive and negatives of each. So that again, it's about discernment and as Rodney was saying, it's about knowledge of the institutions. You're dealing in um, a, a kind of, a, a, um, well, it's like a corporation. You have a thing that, that people like, uh, that would claim that it has a life of its own. Okay, it's an institution. So you have to kind of know the nature of the institution. You have to be inform yourself about that and form how it works. So that whatever you want to do, and you, it's not just an individual, but also collective, you can do that if in, in that space that has been constructed by the rules and regulations and by the relationships, all that sort of stuff that's there. But you have to know that. Okay? And that, that's the hard work. Uh, you have the idea, you have the passion, you have the idea, but then you have the implementation. That means you have to be something of an institutionalist or you have to have institutionalists around you to advise you. Okay, so we, that's where Rod was talking about. We, we would look among the faculty to see who among the faculty would be sensitive to what we're trying to do and be committed. Dan Fallon was a major person because he helped to construct the first petitions for the department. You know, he and I would sit in an office on Sunday and he would work it out more than I because he understood all the bureaucratic uh, language and, and all the stuff that, 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 that would pass through faculty and he helped to shepherd that thing through. But in general, it's like you, you know, we had passion, we had ideas, but we didn't have knowledge of the system. We had to learn that as we move along, as we moved along. And Rodney is really good at that. Now I think he's, uh, he's you know, he, he had a sentence because his family, his mother, he talked about his mother a lot. He, he had some platform, some something there that could, that helped him to be able to be familiar with these folks and to be able to help us to make bridges between them. Okay, and we would intuit people who could help us. Now with Larry, Larry had a natural inclination towards our ideas. That's one of the reasons why uh, he was such a positive factor in what we do. He wasn't one of these people you had to kind of massage and explain a lot of things to. It came to him naturally. Okay, he was he was at a level of humanity that we wanted to experience with other white people on campus. Just, this is just a person, okay, kind of thing. So he had that right. The others we had to kind of get them uh, massaged. Dan Fallon, we saw already he was he was predisposed to doing it. He already had the sensibilities and he had the commitment. He was ready to do something. He was also not. I think he was from Argentina or maybe I don't know. If, where, where he was from, but he had a background where he couldn't understand more than 
the typical white American that we would meet on campus. So yeah, so that, that's so absolutely right. Knowing yourself, appreciating yourself, not being too idealistic about yourself that you don't see the talent that you need to be able to execute the thing that you have to do. Thank you for saying that. Sure, okay, yeah. Thank you very much for saying that. Oh, sure. uh, we have a lot of questions. No, we have a lot of questions from people yeah. on the webinar. Oh, I'm fine. So, uh, I, I'm going to direct this question to, to Dr. William yeah. Lewis. He said, what was it like being part of a new generation of people of color who were able to go to more colleges than the past? How did you undo any discrimination or segregation in school? And how did you push past the hate you received? Oh, yes. yes, yes, hi. Um, the, um, it's, it's kind of interesting to reflect upon the journey that one has taken. Um, I never, ever, even when I was at Binghamton, thought that a PhD would be in my, in my cards. Um, it was just um, being at the right place at the right time and um, and once doors began to open, to be ready to walk through them. And so uh, the, the challenges, and, and just to uh, reflect upon what, uh, what um, uh, John was saying and about the question uh, uh, about being at Binghamton is that I think uh, we felt we were on a mission. We had to do what we had to do. There was no other alternative. We had to go through this process, mainly for those who were going to follow us. We didn't want other students to go through the same problems that we did. We wanted to resolve as many of those problems in order for their existence to be much more comfortable and much more welcoming than what we had to do. So in that respect, uh, we were uh, opening doors and that has become kind of a, a trademark of, of my life in the sense that I have um, uh, and, and John was talking about this as well, being in academia and being the only person of color in, uh, in many situations, whether it be conferences, whether it be uh, receiving, being the first uh, Latinx to receive tenure or the first person of color to receive an endowed chair appointed from the inside or being, or being the first person of color to receive a Guggenheim at Vanderbilt and, and all these, and all these um, uh, accomplishments have come with a sense of isolation uh, that the road up and the road that we have taken and we have uh, enlisted ourselves consciously in this road uh, which is a road of loneliness and solitude where we know we have to move forward in spite of all the obstacles that are presented before us. And the, the irony of all of this is that the, our strength and our determination moves us forward, but don't, um, don't forget that there are lots of people, and that happened here, or that happened also at Binghamton, that there were lots of people who were expecting us to fail. Mm -hmm. They sure. opened the doors for us in many respects because they did not expect for us to complete the kind of things that we were doing. Uh, we were struggling on various different fronts, including for me, the academic front, because I didn't have the, uh, the educational background to be successful at Binghamton. That came slowly when I realized what education was and what I needed to do, and I applied myself. But many of us didn't have the proper training. But in, in any event, the road um, for me has been a very lonely one in which you're constantly opening doors and you do it for the sake of those who come behind you, won't have to put up or won't have to suffer with, with what we have done. I think that's a perfect way for me to ask you the next question from the audience, which is, was it difficult to unite African-Americans and Latinos to work together back then? No, I think it was a natural thing because many of us were from New York and so we were used to being around each other, La uh, Latinos, uh, African-Americans, uh, Asian-Americans. It, it was just a natural thing. And so when we came to Binghamton, it was easy just to find each other because we were different. We looked different. So we wanted to find each other because we had a common past. And, I, and, I, and that's when I go back and say that we were, the ALA was, was visionary because it charted a particular course that we had to take at that time. There was no way we would have been as successful if we had divided 
ourselves. Okay. And each went through a uh, its own development, but we had to come together because there were lots of common ground uh, where we came from, the educational aspect, the struggles, all those things uh, brought us together. And this is where we are as a country. We need to come together in order to be successful. Okay, so okay. I have two I have two questions here that kind of feed into each other. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this question, and so I'm gonna ask this question to both you. Uh, I, I know I have Kendra. Kendra have a question to ask, but I wanted to ask this audience questions first. I told Kendra. So the question is this: um, It says, uh, "One is on getting the department. So what advice would you give to students currently on campus who have experienced some sort of discriminations? What steps should they take? And what advice would you give to Black students as students of color who struggle with identity issues due to the fact that they grew up in predominantly white areas?" Many times the students feel they don't fit in with either community because they feel too black for white people and too white for black people, resulting in low self-esteem and other mental issues. Are there resources that you think they, they should uh, they should search? So are there resources or group on campus for students like that? So what advice would you give to the students? So I'm gonna start with you, Dr. Dr. Lewis, and then uh, Dr. Rodney, I mean, Mr. Rodney to take these questions because these are the things students want to know. Those are very complicated questions. <laughs> and those questions were applicable also to us. And um, uh, you're always going to have people who are, uh, have different development in their own um, self-awareness. And some people will take more time than others. The important thing, I think, is to continue the dialogue. I think we need to speak to each other and we need to share experiences. We need to come together among, uh, around common goals, common, uh, common characteristics, and that's the humanity that John was talking about that we all share. We need to start from there. We need to start from a point where we can all come together to get to a point where we do feel uncomfortable. But there has to be something that needs to draw us together. And if we can emphasize on that common element that we have um, the best interest in mind of all of us to be able to be successful or to be able to change or to be able to develop, I think that that gives us something, some of the glue that we need. And then slowly, I think the rest comes with time. And I think some people need more time than others, but we cannot give up on anybody. I think we need to stick with it and we need to talk and we need to talk and we need to continue to talk and and discuss things, keep the conversation going. Mr. Rodney? Yes. I definitely agree. And I remember back that uh, Dr. Luis would constantly say, where do I belong? Mm. And he would say it out loud. Mm. And when you are that honest, people take you in. People will begin to accept you people begin to see you. He was very transparent. He said, where do, I be, where do I belong? And he created or helped create an organization where he could belong. Now, I think if we were to do this again, all over again now, we wouldn't call it the Afro-Latin Alliance. We call it the Afro-Latin Chinese, <laughs> anti-racist uh, anti whites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because the, the key that we found is if you let people in and include them in significant ways, they begin to share their values, their humanity, their skills, their talents. And collectively, and that's what's needed, to advance the common good, we got to figure out what that common good is and work together to su support those interests. So we hit on something partly by accident and partly because people like uh, John Rowley are so uh, intuitive as human beings. And we accepted that, we listened, and we sort of took that mentoring to heart. And not only back then, but I can see that we've carried it forward in significant ways. So I'm very thankful for the opportunity to see that, see this evolution through these lives, because I know that 
many people have been impacted by that. Definitely. Thank you. And that gives me another opportunity for another question before I ask Andre now. So how did you maintain the push to establish an African Studies Department after you graduated? Or did it happen during your time at BMT? That goes to all of you. So in terms of this department, this vision, how did you guys, was it at your time that this came together? This came to fruition? I think we want to increase presence okay. uh, in uh, all aspects of the university. Uh, so the academic one, which was the one we had assigned ourselves to by accepting admission to the university was our primary focus. And we, so we needed to have that opened up so that there would be more representation of people of color, people like ourselves, and that the curriculum would be opened up so that we would be more reflected in that curriculum. Uh, that was always <clears throat> in our, in our, either in the, the back of our minds or in the fore of our thoughts. When there, strategically, uh, I remember that uh, the, the, there was a persistent um, conversation about opening up these doors academically for greater participation by people, black people and and people of Spanish background, historic uh, uh, Spanish background. <clears throat> this led to, again, I was recruited. I came back as a counselor and then committed myself to whatever the agenda was there. There was con conversations about where we're going to house Black Student Union. You know, we had a, it was a stellar looking, this really beautiful uh, room that was in the main administration, and then there was another one that was in the, near the basement or something like that, where the student center was. So we had a debate about that kind of thing. But that's what we're talking about: that having the access. Okay, so it continued even after I graduated and then I came back. Uh, and again, when I worked on campus for a couple of years, uh, I was still trying to figure out who would be helpful to the agendas that we were setting up, which was again, getting the, the uh, Black Studies programs and the other programs going. So we, we, we never really lost sight of all that. You know, we, we just kept going with it as far as we were able to. Of course, life takes you in different directions and gives you different challenges and sometimes you divert away. But really principally, we were really always focused on that. And I think, um, Dr. Luis came back too on campus and I came, I, I came back on campus to work. So we were kind of, we had a, it was like a magnet for us in a place where we needed to do something. We need to finish a kind of a agenda or do something to complete, give a sense of completion to what we were working with or to add more building blocks to it. Okay. So even just like we're here now, you know, so, I'm so happy that we've survived this long. I'm so happy to see uh, Rodney and uh, Willie and uh, Larry, you know, because um, of all the people that I know have, have gone or going on. It's so great to have, and then to have us so cogent that we're able to speak to these issues and to sort of help people understand that history and, uh, and where, where, well, how they might participate in it and where they're at. But can I, can I just, just about this issue of identity that was raised, I just want to just, just make a comment on that. Look, identity has always been an issue, just to give you some advice to you and how you look at it. With people of color in America, I'm just dealing with America, it's other places too. America tried to set itself up as only having one kind of identity. Okay, and that they were privileged, in fact, you talk about patriarchy, patriarchy society, it's basically it's a white male society. Okay, anybody who wasn't that is going to be made feel uncomfortable in the castles of the skin. So we've always had issues with identity. We were, we were, if you're dealing with us as African peoples in America, we were divided from our historic, our natural uh, cultures. And then we were divided internally. Our psyches were divided. We were divided from men and women. We were divided from our children. All that division is one of the critical challenges of our lives. Okay, so we don't want to say in our particular moment right now, in our lives right now, that that is the only time it occurred. This is an historic challenge that we have to face. So when you, if you're gonna take on that mantle of being black in America, you're gonna take on the challenge of identity. 
And, uh, and they're, again, we come in multitudes of colors, but we're all black. Because anything that is not white certified as white, and that includes Jews, that did include Irish at one time, that included all those other people, okay, they were not white. They had to, they had to find that bona fides as being white, okay? All those people had identity issues and still do, okay? So we, we, we that's, that's, that's the, something that has to be brought into the conversation, but not in a way to say that I have to divide myself off because my skin is a little lighter, because my mama is white, my daddy's white or something like that. Who, does, who doesn't have something white in their background in this country with the, with the way that mis, uh, miscegenation, everything else occurred in the country? So you had to get over the the excuse using identity as an excuse for not unifying. You know, unity you know will enrich your personal identity. Individuality becomes better through unity with others. A person is a person through people. So if you if you have that in your head, then that'll reduce the anxiety you feel about an identity and move you on to an agenda that's very productive. For yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love the African yeah. saying. Oh, a person is a person through yeah, a person is a person right. through community. It's right. an African way of thinking. A person yes. is through community. Ayat, right. right. you had your I um, mean Kendra. Kendra, mm -hmm. could you ask your question? Well, so earlier, Dr. Young, you referenced to the um to kind of the mental toll that it can take, even working in these organizations as a student, trying to balance all these things. And Dr. Riley as well, in talking about identity, I think a big part that comes with organizing as a young Black student or organizing as a Black person at all is feeling like you have to give so much to be a part of something. So um, how would you describe your experiences with that throughout college did it get easier as you move through the workforce? And what advice would you have for current student organizers, student protesters, or just folks in general trying to maneuver this world? Uh, let me answer that in a couple of ways. First of all, I love the fact that young people have a sense of what to do when it comes to self-care. That's something that we probably weren't as sophisticated about as you guys are. There were some exceptions. For example, Dr. Luis was a martial artist. So he came in with some discipline of uh, physical discipline that uh, uh, because you're as leaders, you're working out of energy. So you have to renew that energy, maintain that energy and use the, that energy when when it's necessary. So you have to build reserves. So part of it is that proper nutrition, uh, proper exercise, proper rest, proper stress maintenance, all of that is going to be critical in order for you to do the things that you need to do. And you also have to have the strong social bonds. You know, they talk about the fact that you have to have at least 150 social interactions of various types during the week to be a healthy person. So all of that has to come into play uh, because once you get skewed in the direction of um, this activism to a too, too great a degree, you can injure yourself in ways that you didn't anticipate. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at uh, right here in Rochester are, are a number of people that I've connected with in the past are part of the Black Lives Matter uh, initiatives, protests. And a, f a couple of the folks that I'm sort of looking at are people who were part of uh, trips to Senegal and Ghana that I initiated with others back in the 90s. And they were high school and junior high school people. Now they're out in the streets protesting. I'm also looking at people who have gone through the leadership development program here at the United Way that I've been managing for 20 years. And I sort of uh, motivated some of them to get involved in the civic space. But now I have to go out and sort of counsel them to perhaps take a step back and protect themselves in ways 
um, that the energy of the movement may not allow them to do. Because you do want to survive these things. You want to, this is not, even though it seems like the biggest thing in the world, the most important thing in the world, in a way it is, but life is long. And you want to be around like Dr. Luis and Dr. Riley, myself, and Mr. Gottheim to be able to 50 years from now reflect and share your story. And that's all about self-care. That has to happen. So even by you asking that question, it tells me take a step back, take two steps back. People will understand, they'll appreciate it. And when you come back refreshed, you'll be able to give more. Actually, that's a perfect segue to the question from the audience then. So this is a question for the audience. It's like, how do you suggest should students uphold the same passion for activism out or outside of the college sphere? I found that it was easier to participate to, and be active throughout college with various organizations. But as a recent graduate, I found it a bit more difficult. So how would you suggest we sustain the same passion? Mm -hmm. oh. well, I think alliance with progressive organizations which uh, support those basic values we've been talking about, truth, a sense of uh, honor, loyalty, some goodness, some compassion, all those sort of things. Belonging to those organizations would help. Just dropping in to keep into the conversation. If you can't directly participate in all the activities, you can make contributions and you can keep up with the conversations. That will help you. I guess if you're graduating, you're going to be concerned about paying off the student loans and you're going to be concerned about getting the apartment, the car, and uh, having uh, some liaison with somebody and your social life and all that sort of things. But still, you just give a portion of your time and your resources to something that you think will benefit those things that you value. Okay? If you're an activist, then you're going to want to change society for the better. Okay, to perhaps create more space for participation for people to make life a little easier for people other than yourself. That's a really good thing. That's, that's you uh, acting under two basic, most important factors in your humanity, your empathy and your sympathy. Never lose that, but you can, you can put that in a proper perspective to your overall struggle. So you have to kind of like do what, what most people will tell you to do. If you go into the counseling session, uh, as an adult, they're going to say, well, why don't you list the things you wish, what's your wish list? What are the things you're doing every day? You know, sort of map out what your, what your activities are, what you're committing yourself to, and then prioritize them. But what I, when you do that, you, you can do a little bit, not cut yourself off entirely and get a great deal of soul satisfaction from the little bit that you do. That means like you're just making a contribution to something. You can drop in every now and then. If you find a way to participate more fully in something that is reformative, something that is going to help people to live better lives, then just go ahead and jump in as much as you can. Now, if you're, on, if you're, if you're involved in activities on campus, you're feeling stressed and strained about that, of course, you have to always make sure that your academic agenda is taken care of well, and that, because that's the thing that keeps you there as a student. But if you're, if you're involved in a collective of activists, the school always has resources that it can provide to you uh, through different kinds of grants that it gives out to students and whatnot. Um, we have these things called RAIN grants at one of our places where you faculty can hire students to do certain kinds of things. You sort of make an, a, a, a part-time job of it when you're getting paid for it. That will help you to incentivize, that help to incentivize you, but also it remunerate, remunerate you for what you're doing so you you can you, it's just a matter of understanding yourself in the context of, of institutions or the workplace whatever that what the stresses are the stress points are and then what is your agenda and then set that all up you know prioritize it all so that you can make your best contribution it doesn't have to be the full body full-throated uh, contribution but enough to give you a little soul satisfaction and then if you can do more Hey, go ahead and do it. May God bless you. Thank you so much. So I have a final question 
as it were, before I get, if I get more questions from the audience, I'll let you know. So this goes to each and every one of our panelists, you know, you guys coming back. So this is a question. Are there critiques of yourself, your younger self, Mm -hmm. That your older self, when you look back, you said, you know what? I wish I'd done this. I wish I'd done that. And they're critic of your younger self, your younger self now, looking mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Lots of criticism. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's how you, you know, uh, that's how you learn. You know, well, we're in the field where we're constantly critiquing other people's stuff. And we're constantly looking at what we're doing and then checking ourselves and then correct, correcting ourselves and moving on to something else. That just becomes part and parcel of who and what we are. But if you look back on the youth, you know, I, I, yeah, I think, okay, maybe, I, maybe I, I wish I could have been a little richer. I would have could have been a little this, you know, but I'm not sure I would have changed my basic nature because all of the, the all in the circumstances, because all that stuff has gave, left, left, has brought me to a place where I passed the, the biblical limit for people being able to survive. Okay, and uh, my head is clear about a lot of things, and I find I'm able to make sane choices for stuff. So I wouldn't give up all of that stuff that were considered to vows of youth, okay, in order to, to be different today. I like the fact that I'm sitting here right now communicating with two old friends I haven't seen in about 50 years. Okay, as if, you know, like, and talking about issues from back in the day as if they were just occurred yesterday. I like that, being able to do that. So I wouldn't give up anything from my youth, anything, no matter what it is, you know, more money, better looks, whatever, you know. Oh, you were looking hot there. <laughs> <laughs> For this moment, this moment is, is uh, I will treasure forever. And seeing Larry again, seeing Rodney again, and seeing Willie again, and, and meeting you, and Nathaniel and hearing the students speak, Kendra, and all. I mean, it's just, this is, this is great. I, I wouldn't have given this, trade this for anything. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rodney? Mm -hmm. Similarly, the, re the regret is I had to wait till uh, John Riley reached out and pulled me to this spot. I'm thankful, but I regret uh, not maintaining those contacts over the years because how rich, how much more rich my experience could have been if I had sort of tracked along with uh, Dr. Luis as he was writing and editing those 14 books. Those, those stories, now I got to go back and read them now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Dr. Uh, you know, we, it's interesting because it occurs to me with Dr. Riley, he was such an observer of what was happening at the time that he even did a one-act play uh, while we were students called Easy Rapper. Now, I recognize he stole some things from my personality and behavior. <laughs> I think he might have stole some of Willie's stuff there, but he was critiquing us. Now, when, when I saw some of my attitudes and behaviors go up on, uh, it was a one-act play, I think, one-person play. That's right. Uh, that's right. Uh, I, I quickly uh, took that as a positive critique and adjusted my behavior. But uh, <laughs> So there were so many dynamic things going on. And when you're sort of in the maelstrom of all of that history that was going on then, uh, you kind of sort of missed it, miss it when you walk out into the real life, because that you know that's a unique time in history, similar to what some of our young people are experiencing now, mm -hmm. and we just hope we they take the right lessons, mm -hmm. they learn the systems, because you don't have to know all the rules in order to play the games, and that they survive to be old men and women, uh, mm -hmm. telling their stories and reminiscing and enjoying seeing the smiles on one another's faces like we are. So I'm just grateful. Um, I'll be very candid. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I think that uh, what I'm about to say has to do mainly because of the field that I wound up in, which is education. But one of the things that I do uh, think about, and, and certainly, um, Harper College gave me a wonderful opportunity to be at a 
quality institution and see what quality students are and professors and so on and very demanding. And so well, one of the things that I wish I had done was to pay a little bit more attention to my studies. Uh, I did uh, become very active. Uh, I did do well, but I think I could have done a little bit better in uh, hon honing in on some skills that, uh, that I needed at that time. And slowly I began to, uh, to pay attention, more attention to that. But if you were to ask me what is the most difficult thing that I do on a daily basis, it, it's right. I mean, I've written uh, quite a bit of, uh, of work, but it has always been a struggle. And maybe the struggle is part of who I am and what I bring to, uh, to my writings. But I sometimes wish that, um, that it didn't become so labor intensive, that it would come out more with more ease as it does with, with John and, and Rodney and, and, and even Larry and, and other people. And so uh, I've learned to, uh, to maintain the discipline to stay with it and to see it through, uh, but it is a struggle. And so for my job, I do the most difficult thing that I could possibly imagine. And that is to deal with text and to write a lot. And so I'm constantly, every single day that I write, I face my demons. But I've learned to do that. I've learned to do that. And I've learned not to veer away from that path because it's the way that it has come to me. And so I have to accept that. So I am accepting of that. But I also wish that my high school, my junior high school, and even at Binghamton, if I, I wish I had paid a little bit more attention to getting all those skills down. Uh, but this is the way it's happened. So um, there is no other way for me now. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Larry, as a faculty, as a, as a faculty then, I think your experience is a bit unique here. So please. I, I wrote a book about my films called The Red Thread. And it has a lot of meaning, but it has to do with something that is a continuous uh, link, e even though things seem to be very different. As I look back on all the twists and turns of my life, there's plenty of things that I truly regret that I did. And there's plenty of things that I regret happened to me. And it's still going on. I mean, in a way, I'm lucky that that's still going on. But it is, we, we have a way of human beings that we go on. I mean, either we're defeated even at the beginning or somewhere along the way. But we have the ability to turn whatever comes our way somehow it becomes part of us. And so we're formed by us. And I feel that I'm lucky, although I, I wish I didn't have so much things right now, but still, <laughs> I'm lucky to be still living this. Uh, it's, it's amazing, really. Thank you. I wonder, Kendra, as an activist, a student activist yourself, and, and same thing with Hyatt, any, any comments you guys want to make looking at folks who have laid the, the the land as it were for you guys to now be building on. I wonder what your take is on this. Kendra? Oh, I think I is frozen. Do you hear me? Okay. Can I hear you? I just wanted to give Haya the opportunity to speak. No, yeah, I was just gonna say that um it's it's been really wonderful to hear from all of you guys. It makes me like really want to continue um doing what I am doing in this organization and also continue this after college as well. So thank you. I definitely think um, it's powerful and also jolting to see how history moves in real time. You know, like like you were saying, Mr. Young, like this will one day be us, hopefully imparting this knowledge onto new students. So it feels very like holistic, you know, like circles coming full and then moving on to the next step. So as I said, like I definitely am happy to be in this space. And I think even with um, the Black Student Union, we're trying to create political archives of like how we were created, the things that have happened. You know, we've been searching for newspaper clippings. So the fact that even that video existed and we would have had no idea if this event didn't happen is amazing. Uh, Kendra, you are our- I'm, I'm, I'm actually very grateful that you guys are here. 
Exactly, exactly, exactly. So we the, uh, just a quick thing before uh, I make final comments and I will one day to talk to. Uh, we have this being covered by the BU Pipe Dream, the MT University newspaper, the student newspaper. And they just wanted to confirm that they want to know how people are your preferred, your preferred pronouns, he, him, she, her, they, them, and etc. So um, I, I, it's just, it's, that was a question in the Q&A. They wanted to know, you know, can we refer to how you would prefer, the pronoun you would prefer to be referred to? <laughs> That's interesting. Oh, no. Yeah, that's the generation. That's why this is mm -hmm. fun. Okay. Uh, he is him. He, him, right, right. Okay, he, him. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Louis, same for you? Yes. Okay. Okay, so that, 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 that means we're good on that, on that front. So I wanted to say thank you so much. Um, Nate, because I know you're behind the scene. I wonder if he's there. Dr. Matthews? Oh, no. Okay. So I want to say thank oh, you so much. Uh, he doesn't have anything to say. That's, he just texted. Me. So <laughs> yeah, I want to say all. thank you so much to you all for taking the time to join mm -hmm. us on this. Um, like I said, we really want to celebrate what was done. And you guys laid a foundation that many of us are now building on. And because you laid such a strong foundation, that's why we're still standing. Because I know many of programs that have died. So this is incredible. We deeply appreciate mm -hmm. what you guys have done. We appreciate what you guys are still doing because you are mm -hmm. impacting to us how to even do it better. So we really appreciate that. And I also want to use this opportunity to let you guys know that once COVID is over, we are going to have an in-person where we reach out to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we are going to have an in-person uh, celebration of this in the fall. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, we would like to get in touch with our Female panelists, we have Dr. Deborah Gray-White, who was supposed mm -hmm. to be here, but she couldn't attend today. But if there are other people that we can get hold of, we really appreciate it, because we're looking mm -hmm. for folks. We're reaching out to them. We want to celebrate mm -hmm. what was done. Fire Washington, we found one in LA. We're not sure whether she's the person. So I think mm -hmm. I'm going to share with you guys, so you guys confirm whether she's the same person. Mm -hmm. So we can reach out to her. So on behalf of my department and the faculty and the staff, I want to thank you so much again. We had mm -hmm. over 200, at the height, we had 220 people on this webinar, so wow. which is great, yes. Mm -hmm. So we really appreciate it. It was timely. This is the time for it. We have the Black Lives Movement going on. Mm -hmm. You guys have told us the value of our Black education, why this was important, why you guys fought for that. So mm -hmm. thank you so, thank you so much. Amazing yeah. job. So amazing thank job you. to all of you. So thank wanna you. thank you so thank much for you. this. Thank you. thank you very much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Our thank pleasure. you. <laughs> pleasure. And, and Nate, a big shout, mm -hmm. a big shout out to you, Nathaniel Marquis, Dr. Marquis, for all your hard work on making this a reality. Um, <laughs> it's wonderful to have colleagues like that, that I just, you know, you have the ideas and then you have people like him that will just bring it to life. So I want to say uh, thank you to you for all your hard work on making this a reality. And, and once again, I'm honored mm -hmm. and I'm humbled. Thank so you very much. Thank you. We're honored too. Thank you very much. Okay. God bless. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, right. Thank, you. Thank you so very much.